to the S2Me Safety and Cybersecurity at Home 101 series. Um, glad to have you guys back. Uh, for those of you that were with us yesterday, uh, we did the first episode. Um, we'll do a brief recap on that. Um, but really excited to have you here today. And as we go through this part two uh, of starting the S2Me assessment, uh, feel free to ask questions in the chat or through the Q&A. Um, Evan is running the technical side today and I'm going to be doing the hosting. So hopefully this goes a little smoother. We did have a couple issues on the first one with some technical hiccups, but we got through it. So a um, couple things just to touch on is that, you know, right, right now, information and cybersecurity is, it's all the rage, right? Uh, with COVID-19, this is a, a huge focus. We have all this remote work and remote school and so using the S2Me and taking that assessment can be really helpful for yourself and your staff to get kind of their head wrapped around how better to protect themselves, their family, um, and ultimately the businesses that they work with. So we're gonna cover some truths. Uh, we're gonna recap yesterday and then we're gonna just dive right in. So let's see if we can make this go. All right, so again, welcome back. Uh, glad to have you guys here. Uh, just a quick recap of yesterday. The main points are, you know, you are responsible for your personal safety and cybersecurity. That is just the truth. Um, you can control your risk, but you cannot control the attackers. Uh, so you really are faced with a couple of options. You can use less technology, which I don't think is uh, a good prospect for anybody. We love our toys. We love our tech. Or you can use the technology you already have uh, more safely. And so, you know, part of the challenge that we have is that we do have more technology than ever. Um, but most of us today aren't using that technology uh, as safely as we could be. So by not using that technology safer, we, we actually increase our risk uh, unnecessarily. And then, you know, Evan and I like to say, you know, information security isn't about information or security. It's about people. And we wouldn't you know, care so much about this if people didn't get hurt, if people didn't suffer. And so by not having good security habits at home or using that technology that you have safely, uh, we're putting our children and ourselves at, at unnecessary risk. So what are we going to do about that? Well, the solution that we've come up with is through education and simplification. The easier that we can make it for you to understand your risk and what to do about that risk, uh, the easier time you're going to have in, in learning this. Um, and so with that, I want to introduce you to the S2Me platform. Now, for those of you that were on part one of the session, yesterday we assigned you some homework. Um, so hopefully you got that done. Uh, but if you didn't, we're actually going to walk you through here in the next couple of slides uh, how to get logged in and set up. Um, so introducing part two, um, this is the uh, second episode, if you will, of the S2Me. And what we're going to cover today is household desktop and laptop use. We're going to cover safe practices for internet usage. And we're going to cover choosing and protecting your authentication. And we'll explain a little bit more about what that means as we go. Um, if you do miss a session or two, please email us at info at securitystudio.com and we will get you a session. Uh, we are live streaming this on Facebook, and we will be live streaming tomorrow on Facebook and YouTube. Um, so with that, we're going to dive right in. Um, logging into the S2Me. So for those of you on, go ahead and open up your browser and go to HTTPS backslash backslash S2Me.io. I'm going to give you guys just a moment to make that happen. Uh, while I'm waiting for you guys to get that brought up, I'll tell you my favorite cybersecurity joke. Uh, and that is, what is Forrest Gump's password? It's one Forrest one. So hopefully that made you chuckle. Um, give you just another moment here. See if Evan has any good bad dad jokes for security he can put into the chat. Well, you know, you know I do, but I'm not, uh, I'm not doing it. I'm not in the mood yet. <laughs> well, we'll get this get this rolling. So hopefully uh, all of you have had a chance to, to bring up your browser and go to uh, the S2Me URL. You can see that here in the slide. 
And so what we're going to do is just go ahead and dive right into the tool. So you'll notice there's a sign up button uh, for those of you, if you haven't already done that, go ahead and, and click on that now. Uh, but for those that have already signed up, let's click that sign in button. So pretty straight up stuff here. Uh, very simple, very standard. Again, simplicity is, is the friend of cybersecurity and complexity is the enemy. Um, so just pop in your email and password. Uh, for those of you that have forgotten your password since yesterday, go ahead and click that forgot password link. And uh, let's get, keep going here. Look at that. We even thought ahead and put something in the slide about it. So go ahead and uh, type it in and click sign in. Let's see here. Uh, oh, that's, that's hilarious, Jordan. Um, logging into S2Me. So we do encourage you to use two-factor authentication uh, very strongly. It's just a good habit to have. And so if you can develop that habit now while doing this, that'll carry through with you as you register for other services. Um, so really important here to do two-factor. We don't make you do it, uh, but we really do encourage you. Um, no, there is no need for a promo code. I see someone in the chat asking about that. There's uh, no need for a promo code. So assuming you guys have got to this point, go ahead and get your mobile device and enter the six-digit code. and click submit. It's pretty simple so far, right? So if you're fully logged in, you should see this screen uh, letting you know that you are logged in. And here you'll see at the bottom, the first topic we're gonna cover. Uh, what you see here in this graphic is your rating. And so as we go through this, um, what you're doing is you're answering these questions to get a score, and then that score will show up somewhere here on the scale. So this is our dashboard and portal page. Again, very simple, very clean. We really wanted to focus on keeping this very, um, well, very simple, because that's, again, the friend of security. Complexity is its enemy. So once you're done, you will get a score, uh, and it's, it's based on the credit score model, if you will. It goes from 300 to 850. I can tell you that the very first time I took this, uh, before I was an employee of Security Studio, I was very sure I was going to get an 850. I was also very surprised when I found out I didn't. Um, and so even the most great security people still have room to grow. Um, so that's really nice to know that, you know, as you go through this, if you get a lower score, don't be discouraged. Use it as, as an opportunity to improve. And let's see here, the way we'll uh, calculate as we go through, and it's gonna help you understand your level of risk. As you progress through the assessment, you will see here your percentage of completion. Um, this is you know, gonna go pretty quick, uh, as you know, we, again, trying to keep it really simple. Uh, so we're going to start with topic one, and that's going to be household uh, desktop and laptop use. So go ahead and click on complete topic number one. Hopefully everyone's at this screen along with me. Um, so as we go through this, you can see that the options for most of the questions are yes, no, and not sure. Um, if you're 100% sure, say yes. If you're really not sure, say no or not sure. Um, the effect on your score will be, uh, should be about the same. Uh, as you can see as well, uh, if you answer no, and there are no further questions, then you have completed this part of the assessment and you'll be given a score of 850. If you do answer yes to this question, and there are additional questions that go with it, then those will automatically populate and you can continue through those questions and they'll be factored in to calculate your S2 score. So, you know, 74% um, of Americans own a desktop or laptop. And I would, I don't have the stat here in front of me, but you know, most of us do have. So for the purposes of this, um, unless you are using an old teletype or a modified speak and spell, uh, you're probably gonna say yes to this question. So now that you've said yes to having a household desktop or laptop in use, uh, it's gonna take you to the next level of detail. Answer all the questions to the best of your ability, 
there are no right or wrong answers. And again, if you're not sure, go with not sure. So we're gonna go through the importance of each of these questions. Um, here at question one, you know, how many systems combined are running Windows, Mac, or desktop versions of Linux? This is an important question because the more devices that you have running, the greater your risk can be. Um, it's really easy to secure a computer. Each computer that you add to the equation, it becomes more and more difficult to keep all of them secure and updated. So that's why we're asking this. We wanna have an understanding of how many devices are in your home. Um, myself, uh, my family, uh, we have over 10 devices in the home uh, that we use uh, that are running Windows, Mac, or some kind of Linux. Now, obviously we're an IT household, so we're gonna have more of that. But if you're a larger family, you could have quite a few uh, desktop devices or laptop devices in your, in your house. Um, you know, the next question that's really important is, uh, are the operating systems being kept up to date? And the reason that's really important is that a very large percentage of security breaches occur because the computer wasn't updated. So the manufacturer had already made a fix for the security vulnerability, but folks hadn't updated yet. And so because of that, uh, the bad guys are able to exploit that and, and cause havoc, steal data, you know, disrupt your, your system. Um, so it's really, really important to, to keep those up to date. Most operating systems these days provide an automatic way to update. So that actually leads us to our next question. Are security updates and patches applied automatically on all systems? Um, if you're not doing automatic updates at home, that's a pretty safe bet. I know for IT people, we um, sometimes will do it a little bit delayed because we have really complex systems and patches can sometimes cause trouble. But for the average home user, um, you're really quite safe to, to apply those patches. So doing it automatically just gives you one less thing to worry about. It reduces your risk and it helps increase your security and your safety. And the same is true for all of your software. So as we look at question one five, you know, are we updating our browsers? Are we updating our Adobe Reader, um, Java, if we have it on our machine? Every application that we run and every a uh, bit of computer code that we run with it, so like Java, things like that, uh, are a potential way for the bad guys to exploit our computers and cause us harm and steal our information. So it's just as important to keep our software up to date as it is to keep our operating systems up to date. So as we move into question one six, it, it's asking the question a little bit differently. So are you updating and are you doing it automatically? Again, automatic updates are going to save you a lot of time and headache. Um, and again, there's just one less thing to think about, one less thing to worry about. Um, question one seven is, you know, is all the software coming from reputable sources? Pirated, illegal, or unlicensed software is never used. Now, some of you may uh, be hesitant to answer this. Answer it truthfully. We don't care uh, if you have some MP3s that you got from Napster years ago. But what we do care is that you know that when you have that type of stuff, the chances that it's infected with malware is much, much higher. So you really do want to try to get all of your software from reputable sources. That reduces the chance that that software is going to be compromised. Um, as a rule of thumb, you know, myself, uh, I stopped doing the MP3 thing years ago uh, because I was downloading one day and I got infected and the, the hassle to rebuild my system just wasn't worth it. And, they had come out with Spotify and Apple Music, so I switched. Um, question 1A, are any computer systems running Windows, Mac OS, or desktop versions of Linux provided by an employer? I would venture to say that the majority of us now are gonna say yes to this. Most of us are working or schooling from home, and so for question 1A, you know, we are, we are running those employer-provided devices. And the reason we ask this question is because, again, there could be different security concerns or profiles uh, on a device provided by an employer. There might be additional steps of security that we need to take. Um, we might also be inadvertently exposing our home to insecure computers if our employer hasn't taken all the necessary steps to secure their devices. Uh, this is a, a good one here is 110. And this is a practice I actually uh, have gotten better at over the years. And that's using separate systems to do sensitive things. So 
uh, I have a computer that I use primarily for banking uh, and medical. And I don't use that computer to watch Netflix. I don't use that computer to check my email or surf the internet or look up funny internet memes to share. Um, I use it solely for those financial transactions. And the reason that I do that is because I wanna limit my risk to those most sensitive accounts getting compromised. If I was to use that computer for everything, you know, surfing the web and, and tweeting and Netflix and gaming and all of these things and using it for banking and medical, the chances that my banking or medical information could be compromised goes up significantly significantly with each additional type of application that I use on that machine or each other purpose that I use that machine for. If you did answer yes to question 1-8, then you would have been prompted for an additional question. Um, and as you can see, employer provided systems are never used for conducting personal business or for entertainment purposes. This is also something to, important to understand. Uh, a lot of families uh, have you know, revealed to me that they do allow the kids to use the work computer um, to do non-work things. And they do that out of a matter of convenience or because they don't have enough devices in the home due to financial circumstances. Uh, but we really do want to avoid doing that. We want to keep business, business, and, and personal, personal. And we want to try to keep those systems separate. Hopefully you guys are all still along with us. Um, again, answer your, the questions to the uh, best of your ability and there are no right or wrong answers. So for question one, one, uh, are privileged or administrative accounts are, are not used for general everyday computing. They're only used when absolutely necessary. So what this question is asking is, do you have a separate account that has less permissions? When you set up your computer, did you only set up one account or did you set up several? One of which would be an administrator account, so that account with extra special privilege that allows you to do things like install software or make configuration changes to the computer versus an everyday account, which is just a regular user account. Um, this is a good practice to have. I myself uh, follow this practice with my personal devices and obviously uh, we follow this practice with our work devices. Um, it's not terribly hard to set up. If you don't know how, uh, reach out to us. Uh, we can pop you a few links and you know, show you what, uh, what that could look like. Um, but again, the, the main point here is to try to have them separate if you can, uh, but do answer the question honestly. Are you using full disk encryption? for the device, uh, BitLocker, Mac OS, uh, File Vault, et cetera. Um, what that question is asking you is, you know, have you turned on the encryption offering uh, that your computer provides uh, to encrypt the whole hard drive, if you will? And then question one three is, or sorry, one thirteen is, are all systems running antivirus and anti-malware protection with real-time scanning enabled? And this is an important differentiator in this question. Uh, I've run into a, quite a few folks that say, yep, I'm running antivirus. And I say, okay, how often do you scan? And when they check, they find out that it hasn't scanned since they've installed it. So make sure that you've got that real-time scanning set up. Make sure that you're also thinking about doing uh, scheduled full scans. Question uh, 1.14. Is uh, antivirus, anti-malware software updated automatically? Again, you see a theme forming here. Do you update and do you have that updating done automatically? Um, again, automation makes your life easy and it gives you one less thing to worry about. So we're almost there. Last two questions for this topic. Are full system malware and virus scans run monthly or more frequently? So that's gonna be that scheduled uh, malware or virus scan that we just talked about in the previous question. Uh, and then question 116 uh, is, are personal firewalls running on all systems? So by personal firewall, we're talking about the Windows firewall. We're talking about a, a software firewall that maybe you downloaded and installed. Um, so that's what we're referring to there when we say personal firewalls. If you answered yes to question 116, then you are presented with question 117. And have the personal firewall rules been reviewed on all systems within the last six months? So another way to ask this question is, do you know 
what the firewall rules are and do you periodically check on that. Ideally, you should be looking at it at least every six months. Uh, I myself check every time that I make some kind of change. I install or uninstall some software. I usually go back and check those firewall rules. Uh, I'll also check after I update software. Uh, some software has been known to make uh, changes to their security or privacy uh, during updates. And so I always go back and double check. All right, is everybody ready for the next topic? Looks like we're getting some good feedback. Somebody want to pop something in the chat? Are you guys ready to move on or do you want a couple minutes to complete? I'm excited for the next topic, Ryan. All right, well then let's just keep this ball rolling. <laughs> so there are several ways to find the next topic. Uh, topic two is going to be around safe, uh, safe practices for internet usage, but it's pretty self-explanatory, right? So as we get to topic two, uh, we're going to say, do you use the internet for browsing the web or email communications? Uh, if you answer no to this, there are no further questions about this topic. You get a score of 850 and you have to explain to me how you managed to get on this webinar. If you answer yes to this question, we do have some additional uh, questions in the topic in order to be able to calculate your score. So again, we're going to answer yes. Um, honestly, I don't know how you got to the website if you didn't use uh, the web. So remember that all uh, users um, in the different age groups across the US are using the internet in very high percentages. Um, 18, 29 year olds, it's 100%. And, and it goes down in percentage, but you can see even there at the 65 year old and older crowd, we're still looking at 73%. I mean, that's, that's you know more than half and almost three quarters. Yeah, and the reason why you know that's, it's justification too, you know, Ryan, for what we were talking about yesterday. Um, you know, trying to tie, you know, all the questions that we're asking to real world examples. You know, you don't just pull these things sort of out of the air. Uh, so yesterday we went over that same number and, you know, it's here now. Yeah, and, and I think that's an important thing to know. And, and I would expect as we continue telemedicine and, and telehealth and telework and all of that, that number is only going to go up. So in section two, again, want to answer all the questions to the best of your ability. There are no right or wrong answers, just the truth. That's something we like here at Security Studio, the truth. We also like mission before money. You'll hear us say those things a lot. Um, so question 2.2 is, do you know how to check the validity of websites and always check before logging into them? So one thing to understand about this question is a long time ago we would say something like there's a little lock in the browser and if you see the lock you're good that's partly true if you see the lock you're probably good but you may want to take some additional steps like double checking the url double uh, clicking on that lock and seeing where the security certificate actually comes from uh, sometimes that lock is put there by a bad guy so you always want to double check that. Um, question, uh, there's a question here. If you're on a public network and see the lock on a website, are you still safe? Uh, again, the lock doesn't necessarily indicate that you're safe. Um, you want to double check. You want to just make sure. Uh, whether you're on public internet or whether you're at home, um, it's still, you know, you're connecting to a mystery computer uh, until you verify it. So just make sure to double check that. The easiest way is to click on the lock a little drop down will come down and it'll show you where the security certificate comes from. If the address on the security certificate doesn't match uh, the company name or the address that you're connecting to, um, that might be a suspect site. You might be better off moving on. Uh, question 2.3, when you're done with a website, do you always log out rather than simply closing the browser window? Now, this is an interesting one. Um, and this is actually one of the ones that helped me change my behavior. Um, I knew sessions would stay. So when you log into a site, you create something called a session, and then that thing stays open until you log out. Well, in the early days, those sessions would expire relatively quickly. So a lot of us got in the bad habit of, of just closing the tab, and we knew that the system would auto log us out within a certain amount of time. These days, those sessions last much, much, much longer. So it's important to, to know to log out, not just close. Uh, question 2.4, you know how to check the validity of emails and always check if they're genuine and safe. 
So this question is really asking you about phishing. And do you know how to recognize a suspect email? Do you know how to verify uh, that email? One of the things in, in this COVID world right now that I'm encouraging people to do is if you get an email asking for data or money or uh, uh, granting access to, to sensitive data is to do a video call verification. Uh, there are several other methods, checking the link, so on and so forth. Um, but again, here we want you to answer truthfully so that you can learn and grow. Question 2.5. Um, I always check the legitimacy and safety of unexpected emails, especially those that are asking for sensitive or personal information. So again, back to that, if you're asking for money, if you're asking for me to give you data on a, a colleague or myself or friends, um, that should always put you in a heightened sense of, uh, of alert. So anytime the email wants you to take some kind of action involving data or money, you might want to pause for a second and, and really double check that. Um, you know how to, so question 2.6, you know how to validate the safety of hyperlinks in the emails and always check them before clicking them. The easiest way to do this is to hover, uh, but with the advent of the cloud, sometimes those links look really funny. Uh, and so again, a more manual check uh, could be helpful. Uh, I try to myself avoid clicking links that come in emails um, just because I, it's a very risky thing. Uh, but you know, check that. Uh, question 2.7, I never log into websites from links and emails. So exactly, uh, myself, I would say true to this, um, but a lot of people still do because it's convenient. Question 2.8, I never open a file attachment in an email unless I'm specifically ex expecting one. So uh, as we ask you these questions, I'm sure you're noticing there's a little bit of training in this. And I'm sure those of you that have clicked uh, false to some of these questions have noticed a pop-up that lets you know about your, your risk in that area. And that's one of the things we really tried to build into this. So as we go through the rest of this series, you're going to see that this is part assessment, but it's also part teaching you the safe behaviors that you need to know so that you're in a better position to protect your family and the people that you care about. Uh, question 2.9. Uh, I keep my work email separate from my personal email. So this is a really important thing to do because um, it's too easy to, uh, to borrow from Ghostbusters, right? Don't cross the streams. It, it's too easy to accidentally send the wrong thing from or to the wrong uh, recipient. Uh, you also can have an issue if you're a Google Chrome user where uh, contacts from your corporate Google account and your personal Google account merge. Um, so you, you really do want to um, try to keep those separate if you can. All right, keeping along here, question 2.10, uh, I do not disclose any sensitive information in a communication, telephone, email, um, that I did not initiate myself. In other words, if the bank calls me and says, what's your social security number, I hang up the phone. Uh, but if I call the bank and they ask me for that as part of my identity verification, then I give it out. Question 2.11. Uh, I do not send sensitive information, financial, personal, or private through unencrypted email. Uh, most of us do not use encrypted email. Most email services are unencrypted unless that has been set up by um, the provider. So ProtonMail is a good encrypted mail provider, uh, but your standard Gmail is, is generally not encrypted. Your standard Outlook is generally not encrypted. Um, 2.12, I always ensure that communications are encrypted when conducting business or transferring sensitive information online. Again, that's that little lock. Um, that, that lock represents encryption, but you want to double check and make sure that it's valid. Uh, question 2.13, I do not use peer-to-peer -peer file sharing services, uh, LimeWire, uTorrent, BitTorrent, um, you know, they were a lot more popular back in the day, uh, but they are still used quite a bit. Um, and using a peer-to-peer -peer file sharing service can present additional risk to exposure to malware. So that's something you wanna give consideration to before doing. Piece of cake, right? We're 20% done through the entire assessment so far. So try not to get stuck or spend too much time on the recommendations. We're gonna have a lot of time for that later. Everybody ready to move on to the next topic? It's the last one for today. Here we go.
I am Ryan, again. All right, choosing and protecting authentication. So question three, one, do you have accounts online, uh, or, uh, online or on a system or device that require a login? Again, if you say no, I would be very surprised. Um, most of us are gonna say yes to this, and so let's dive in. So the average person has 70 to 80 passwords, and most of us have accounts we don't even know we have. Uh, I recently stumbled across a MySpace page of a friend of mine that was pretty sure he never created the thing in the first place. So we wanna go ahead and, and use safe practices when we're setting up these accounts. So please do answer these to the best of your ability. There are no right or wrong answers, just the truth. Question three, two, I use multi-factor authentication on all online accounts that could potentially hold or process sensitive or private information. So this is email, social media, your banking, your healthcare related accounts, things of that nature. Um, for those of you that are unfamiliar, two-factor, multi-factor, two-step authentication. This is where you get an additional code sent to your phone via text message. Uh, sometimes it goes to email or sometimes it'll call you uh, actually at a phone number and then you answer and, and press one to acknowledge that you got the call. Uh, if you don't have that set up on those primary accounts, that's a good practice. Question 3.3, all systems I use, desktop computers, laptops, mobile phones, tablets are secured with authentication, strong passwords, pin codes, and or two-factor authentication. Uh, this is a good habit to have. Um, and we'll dive more into what you know strong passwords and things like that are uh, as we kind of recap the risk stuff later. But basically, you want to make sure that anything that has sensitive information on it or that you use to conduct any kind of business or personal business uh, has some type of strong authentication. Question three, four, all of my passwords are long. And by long, we mean 10 characters or more. Um, we want to make sure that we're going with long passwords. The longer the password is, the harder it is to crack. Uh, it, letters and numbers and special characters uh, can help, but length is the number one thing you can do to make a safe password. And then question 3.5, which of the following passwords is the strongest? Now we're on to 3.6. Uh, I change all of my passwords regularly, quarterly or even semi-annually, even if I'm not forced to. Um, this is a, a good habit to have, uh, but we are also, you know, giving guidance that if you haven't had your password breached uh, and it's a relatively long and secure password, you might not need to update it all the time. Um, unless you're using a password manager, which leads us to question 3.7. Where I must use passwords, I use a reputable password manager application. LastPass, KeePass, and Keeper are, are some of the good ones. Um, I myself do this because I cannot keep track of the hundreds and hundreds of logins. And I do wanna to try to keep my passwords pretty up to date. Um, and so instead of trying to remember all that, I just use a password manager. Question, uh, which password was from Strauss? Oh, okay. Question 3.8, I do not allow websites to remember my password when logging in. So while it's convenient to allow the website to remember your password, that actually could be a risk. Um, so that's just something to, to know uh, because if they have stored your password, then they have it. And if they get breached, then somebody else could get it. Question 3.9, I do not use the same password for multiple accounts. Um, this is another bad habit that we have as humans. Uh, question 3.10, none of my passwords are on the 25 most common password list from 2017 or 2016 or 2018 or 19. Basically, if your password is password, password one, password one, two, three, four, you're probably on the list. Um, question 3.11, I do not share my passwords with anyone. Um, so passwords only is good as the security around it. And so if you share it, then other people know it. The more places it exists, the greater the chances it could get lost and misused. And there you go. We've successfully made it through topic one of household desktop and laptop use. Hopefully I kept you guys engaged. We are now 30% done with the S2Me assessment. We did take some time getting through these topics. Um, we will continue to, to go forward. It takes about 15 to 20 minutes to get through the entire assessment when you don't have me reading it out loud for you. Um, and some of you I can see in the chat have already completed it. So hopefully um, maybe you learned something here today that you didn't know when you were taking it by yourself. And that is it for part two. So what's coming next? 
We're going to continue on through the S2Me assessment. Uh, part three is going to be tomorrow, and we're going to cover securing mobile devices, securing Wi-Fi, and secure gateway. If you have any questions, please reach out to us at info at securitystudio.com. You can follow us at, at Studio Security, and we will have this posted out to our YouTube channel soon, and we hope to see all of you tomorrow. We do have a poll that we've put up, and we would love it very much uh, if you guys would take that and let us know what you think. Evan, anything you want to say to the group in closing? Uh, sure, yeah. Good job, uh, Ryan. I, I appreciate you know going through and uh, kind of explaining these things. Um, when you're in the webinar, uh, as you're going through in, in future you know parts, we have part three coming tomorrow. Uh, if you have questions, you know feel free to type them in the in the question and answer. It's a little bit easier to track them there. Um, but the uh, oh the submit button won't light up in the poll. Well, that's another bug we're trying to work through. Sorry about that. Um, no, great job. These are all really important things. I think you did a good job explaining those things. If they didn't make sense to you, uh, let us know. Um, you'll see in version two, we do expand a lot more on uh, just walking people through. I know at the beginning of the presentation, it seemed very basic, right? It's click here, click here to log in. It's those kinds of things. But we have to keep in mind that what we're trying to do is kind of level set with people that it's all new to them, right? You know, walking somebody through kind of things that seem really basic for us uh, aren't basic for everybody. Uh, so that's kind of the point of, you know, getting there. Uh, yeah, so any questions, you know, follow up with us afterwards. You can email them at info at securitystudio.com. Invite others if you join in, uh, you know, in session three or part three. Um, you're still going to get value because we're going to talk about those topics. And I think tomorrow I'll be online uh, to, to do the presentation. It's a lot easier when I don't have to show my, um, show my face. I can't stand looking at myself on the, on the screen. Uh, so hopefully you guys found value and uh, we'll see you all tomorrow. Thanks everyone. Looking forward to seeing you tomorrow. All right. Take care.